Good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you for being here today. Uh, we do have some extra programs. If anyone would needs one, we'll raise your hand, and Caitlin will get one for you. All right. Speaking of the program, we do have a slight change. Uh, Congressman Bishop has to be somewhere, so we're going to let him talk first. Um, to start out, welcome to our commemoration in honor of National POW, former POW Recognition Day, which was April 9th on Easter, the 50th anniversary of Operation Homecoming, and the 25th anniversary of the opening of the National Prisoner of War Museum. Please rise if you are able. We're going to play the national anthem. Thank you so much. Thank you. May be seated. We're so very grateful that many of you come out today to help us honor our former POWs and to celebrate the 25th year of the National Prisoner of War Museum. Since 1970, Andersonville National Historic Site has served as a memorial to all prisoners of war throughout our nation's history. In the early days of the park, the major focus was on the site's Civil War history when we were just starting out. In 1998, uh, through the initiative and perseverance of the American Ex-Prisoners of War, AXPOW, and the Friends of Andersonville, the park issued in a new era through the creation of the National Prisoner of War Museum. The museum, designed to last throughout time as a living monument to American POWs, focuses on the experience, experiences of POWs with the themes of capture, living conditions, news and communications, those who wait, privation, morale, and escape and freedom. We are honored today to have speakers whose life experiences are reflected in our museum's themes. Um, our first speaker today uh, will be Congressman Sanford Bishop. Congressman Bishop has been a steadfast supporter of the Andersonville National Historic Site over the years. Is he getting beat up by a flag? <laughs> That's not fair. I'm sorry. <laughs> He has represented the second congressional district of Georgia in the U.S. House of Representatives since 1993. Please welcome Congressman Sanford Bishop. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Superintendent. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Let me say good afternoon to all of you, and I want to thank all of our active duty service members and all of our veterans uh, for your service, as well as I want to thank your families for the service and sacrifices that you made, uh, that the families made, because when the service member joined, 
the families joined and they served and sacrificed together. So I'm honored to join all of you today once again on these hallowed grounds. It was just 25 years ago this month that we stood right here for the dedication of this National Prisoner of War Museum. Today, it continues to stand as a solemn reminder that the freedoms that we enjoy in this country are not free. Somebody paid the price, and it was our veterans and our POWs who paid the price, and our active duty soldiers and sailors and airmen and Marines who continue to pay that price today. These courageous souls that we honor here with this museum will never be forgotten and will always stand as an example of strength, of resiliency, and commitment to all that is great about America. Yet, it is poignant that this museum stands here in Andersonville. Andersonville Cemetery has an interesting and a unique history. As you know, it was the site of a Civil War prisoner of war camp that held prisoners of war for both the Union and the Confederates. Unsanitary conditions led to the deaths of thousands of soldiers from both sides. The site reminds us of the worst that troops may be forced to endure, but from its horrific history, we forged a site that honors prisoners of war and speaks to the endurance of the human spirit. The late U.S. Senator John McCain, who truly embodied what it meant to be patriotic, compassionate, and to stand with conviction was with us in the spring of 1998 for this museum's dedication. I'm reminded of his words as he reflected on his POW experience at the Hanoi Hilton in North Vietnam. Here's what he said, I fell in love with my country when I was a prisoner in someone else's. I loved it not just for the many comforts of life here, I loved it for its decency, for its faith in the wisdom, justice, and goodness of its people. I loved it because it was not just a place, but an idea, a cause worth fighting for. The cynic will see weakness and shame in prisoners of war. But John McCain and our many POWs who served and endured capture have taught us otherwise. The legacy of the prisoner of war is that they are a reminder of all that is good in our country, for all for which we fight. They are examples of courage and perseverance. They remind us of the strength that we draw from one another to overcome our greatest challenges. The lessons we can learn from them are crucial to our lives and the well-being of our nation. And so it is no wonder that all those years ago our country came together behind a vision to create the National POW Museum. For decades, our community sought to transform Andersonville into a National Historic Site with a memorial that would commemorate the service and sacrifice of our POWs. Thanks to their efforts and work with Congress and support of lots of folks all across the country, including President Jimmy Carter, in 1976, a monument dedicated to all POWs was unveiled. But the work wasn't done. In the 80s, they were joined by the American ex-prisoners of war 
which sought to create a space where the histories and experiences of former prisoners of war are accurately preserved and never forgotten. During my first term as a member of Congress, I was happy to join my colleagues in Congress to support and lead the effort. And in 1994, the Park Service was directed to build the museum. The ground was broken in the summer of 1996. And just two years later, we gathered for this museum's dedication. Today, the museum continues to welcome Americans and those from around the world. And with the National Parks stewardship, the museum continues to educate new generations of Americans about our country's history, as well as the dedication, the sacrifice, and the honor of those who have served and sacrificed to protect this great nation. I would like to recognize all of our veterans here today, from Vietnam and Korea through Desert Storm in Iraq as well as Afghanistan. I want to thank all of you for your service and contributions to our great nation. I'd like to thank the dedicated staff of the National Park Service, whose devotion ensures that this museum continues to fulfill its mission. In concluding, the National Prison of War Museum stands as a beacon of hope, reminding us of the strength and the resilience of the human spirit. On this 25th anniversary, let us honor those who have faced unimaginable challenges as prisoners of war by reaffirming our commitment to liberty, justice, and the pursuit of a more peaceful world. Together, we can carry on the legacy of these brave souls standing united as a nation, inspired by their courage and forever grateful for their sacrifices. May their stories continue to light the way for generations yet to come as we strive to create a world in which no one must endure the hardships of captivity ever again. Thank you so much. God bless you, God bless America. And before I take my seat, it is my privilege and my honor to ask uh, the superintendent to please stand with me uh, as well as her boss, if he would come. I would like to present this certificate of special congressional recognition presented by Congressman Sanford E. Bishop to the National Prison of War Museum on the 25th anniversary in recognition of outstanding achievement, service, and public distinction this April 22nd, 2023. Signed, Sanford E. Bishop, your member of Congress. Yeah, it's, uh, are you okay over here? Do we need to move you? Okay, I'm sorry. Wow. I didn't expect that plaque. That is, that is kind of neat. Um, so, <laughs> our first speaker, you're about to get some relief, Bill. Our first speaker today, our second speaker, I should say, is Bill Arcuri, who has long supported our park mission as a public speaker and formerly as the chairman of the Friends of Andersonville. Bill graduated from the United States Military Academy at West Point in June of 1970. He was commissioned a second lieutenant in the U.S. Air Force and received his pilot wings in July of 71. He was assigned to the 744th Bomb Squadron at Beale Air Force Base in California and flew in support of Operation Linebacker 1 and 2 from May 72 to December 72. While he was flying his 44th mission, when his 
aircraft was shot down on December 20th, 1972 over North Vietnam. He was captured and interred at the infamous Hanoi Hilton. As a result of injuries, Bill was released in the first group of POWs on February 12th of 73 during Operation Homecoming. Please welcome Bill R. Carey. Thank you. It's an honor and privilege for me to be here to speak to you today. Before I go into my remarks, I just give you a brief history of my mission. And I want to Ill Ill <coughs> remark that the similarities between me and the older POWs we have here, Wayne, Bill, uh, was maybe my last mission and my capture, but after that there were no similarities. When I was brought into the Hanoi Hilton, they, um, they had a well-organized uh, organization. Uh, they took every effort to take care of the, the new guys coming in. And uh, it was that night on uh, December 20th, uh, we were in the third wave. Uh, we were at 36,000 feet. We had dropped at the... Um, Railroad Marshaling Yards, uh, northwest of Hanoi, and we got uh, we got hit by two to three surface air missile missiles, which uh, um, we sustained bad uh, some bad damage to our aircraft, and eventually we were forced to bail out. I ejected uh, going through about thirty thousand feet at about four hundred knots and sustained injuries, which we call flailing, because we were going too fast. But uh, you had to get out of the airplane, and time was your enemy as the plane was coming to the ground. I dislocated my right knee and almost dislocated my left knee when I hit the ground because of my injuries. The only medical treatment I received while I was there was by the one North Vietnamese who, after they stripped me of my equipment, they wanted me to get up and follow them, and I pointed to my right leg, and it was totally dislocated <clears throat> and he shouldered his AK-47 grabbed my ankle put his foot in my crotch and he popped my knee back in the joint which the doctor said when I got back was probably saved my leg because it got the blood circulating again I was in the Hanoi Hilton the next day and uh, was only in solitary for a few days and then moved into a big room where we had nine recent shoot downs all linebacker two all badly injured uh, in, in July, in January, they moved us into the uh, New Guy Village, a section of the prison, and they started bringing in some of the older pr prisoners of war who they considered were sick and wounded. And it was in, in the January 26th where we, they announced that there was a ceasefire and that we may be going home. Uh, I can remember talking to Ray Volden, who was uh, on crutches, and I, I asked Ray, I said, Ray, you know, I'm, I'm a new guy here. It's only going to be another 30 days for me. You, you older guys need to get home. But they had said that the, uh, they had, the older prisoners had said that they weren't coming out of the prison until all the, the sick and wounded were released. So in, in that respect, I was last man in almost and the first one out. Um, when I met some of the older guys in Dallas, uh, Jeffrey introduced me to his wife by saying, this is Bill. He came in with his overnight bag, yeah. and I said, yeah, yeah, well, there's a time to be first in your class, and there's a time to be last, and this is one of those. So fortunately, I was on the first plane out. I was given the names of, uh, uh, I, I think my list had like 250 names on it, uh, because they knew I'd be coming out first, and uh, I was able to go through the list that Roger Shields had on the airplane of all the POWs and I didn't bring out any name that wasn't already on the list. But having that, um, those names kept my mind going because that's what I, I spent my, all my spare time I had there memorizing those names. What I want to talk to about today is um, the importance of the, uh, the museum here. As, as it was said, 1970, Congress designated Andersonville 
historic site as a memorial to all American POWs. Money for this museum was raised by the National Park Service, the Friends of Andersonville, and the American ex-prisoners of war over a period of 28 years. And this museum was dedicated on April 9th, 1998. What's the significance of this date? April 9th, 1942, that the United States forces surrendered on the Bataan Peninsula, beginning the Bataan Death March and April 9th is now known as National Former POW Recognition Day. During our country's long history, there have been about 565,000 prisoners of war. From the Revolutionary War through World War I, there were about 438,000. World War II and Korea accounted for about 137,000 prisoners of war, leaving only about 800 men and women being classified as POWs since Vietnam through all our current wars. It's difficult to determine the number of living POWs as it was not really tracked except for Vietnam and the current uh, wars, but there are statistics from the VA. In 2004, there were approximately 32,550, and then in 2005, approximately 29,000, according to the VA. In 2015, that number was down to 22,641. Right now, there's about 167,000 World War II veterans still living, based on data on 2022. The 180 daily death equates to a yearly rate of 65,700, which means in under three years, we will be down to just a handful of World War II veterans. How that relates to the number of living POWs is difficult to determine, but the most recent accounting I could find from June 2020, where there was an estimated at only about 3,300 living POWs. The number was based on POWs receiving care from the VA. The vast majority, over 90%, were World War II and Korean POWs. This year, there are several milestones being celebrated. We're here today to celebrate the 25th anniversary of the National POW Museum. It was 50 years ago that the peace agreement was signed and in the Vietnam War. It was 50 years ago that Operation Homecoming returned all the American POWs from North and South Vietnam. And I was one of those POWs. This year, I will be attending our 50th NAMPAL reunion at the Nixon Library, which will recreate the White House dinner which is May 1973, 50 years ago. This nation is rapidly losing a part of its history. In a few years, we will be without our World War II and Korean veterans who were POWs. That will leave a number of less than 400 former POWs from Vietnam, the Gulf War, Iraq, and Afghanistan. That is why this museum is so important, because as we continue to lose our former POWs, we lose their living history as well. We will only have institutions like this National POW Museum to educate and remind our nation of the cost of freedom. It is a common trend that as time moves on, this country loses entrance, interest in its history that is not front and center. The past 25 years, Andersonville National Historic Site could draw on hundreds of former POWs from World War II, Korea, Vietnam, to participate in yearly events, former National POW Recognition Day, Memorial Day, Veterans Day, Fourth of July, and in September, the POW MIA Recognition Day and Veteran Day events. There was a yearly ride home events that brought hundreds of former POWs from all wars to Andersonville with events at the Georgia Southwestern University and South Florida Technical College which helped to captivate the local community. <clears throat> the next 25 years may be more challenging as the resource of former POWs, to quote General MacArthur, is fading away. It will take extra effort on the part of the staff here, on the part of the Friends of Andersonville, and the remaining former POWs to help keep this history alive. My veteran POW attire is part of the inventory here at the National POW Museum, 
And I will continue to support the museum as much as possible, as this community is privileged to have, as part of the Andersonville Historic Park, the home of the National POW Museum. And I'm putting the park on record that I've marked my calendar April 2048, <laughs> that I will be back for the 50th anniversary okay. of the park. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much, Bill. Well, I'll try and be here with you. Um, next to the podium, um, we have Sally Morgan. Sally M was born in Ten Tencent, I've been really struggling with that word, China, of a Chinese mother and American father from Spray, North Carolina, who was stationed in Tencent after the Boxer Rebellion. During World War II, when Sally was a child, she and her two brothers found themselves prisoner of war when Manila, Philippines, was taken over by Japan. Held prisoner for three years and two months, Sally was 14 when liberated by the 11th Airborne. Sally has been a member of the American Ex-Prisoners of War since 1973 and has long shared her stories with visitors to Andersonville since before the museum was built. So she's been a huge <coughs> supporter. Sally? Hey, thank you. You're welcome. You did such a marvelous job. Oh, I'm sorry. Did I mess up? Oh, man. You know more than... <laughs> Somebody found this biography of you. Oh. Watch the watch of course. Okay. Okay. <laughs> that was absolutely great. Where did you get all that stuff from? <laughs> and and uh, thank you. I am so honored to be here just to share a little bit of my background. And I am so privileged and I am so humble for being in this country. I will go a little bit further on my love for my veterans and their work and for the missionaries from different churches that came to my country and helped, brought the gospel. And of course, I'm one of the recipients of the love from the missionaries and from the military. Um, as I was working in my mind, what I'm going to tell you that you don't already know. And, uh, uh, and the, the program answered, did such a beautiful job. My vest says, former POW, okay? No. I'm an informer internee. A POW is afforded to the military. The reason I am eligible that they led me to come into the American Next Prisoner of War organization, they changed their bylaws <laughs> so that the internees can come and the bylaw read, citizens captured by an enemy. Hello? <laughs> you got me? <laughs> And I've been with the organization, the American ex prisoners of War, and I am so honored since 1973. And uh, I was living in Kansas City, Missouri at that time, and it came in the paper that some of the POWs was having a reunion. And, uh, and I thought, that's interesting. At that time, their headquarters was out of Tampa, uh, Florida, the organization. And like I said earlier, I am so honored and because their bylaws were changed to allow the civilian attorneys to be a member of the organization. So, um, I, I, one of the things that went through my mind was I was going to say, I'm not a former POW, I'm not a POW. I'm a civilian internee. And that happened to be at the wrong time at the wrong time place at the wrong time and whatever. Uh, my, I'm just going to give a short synopsis. My daddy was from North Carolina. He's, yay. oh yay, thank you. <laughs> and, uh, and he, uh, 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 now you remember I'm 92 years old. Uh, um, and uh, uh, he was uh, with the 15th Infantry and stationed um, 
um, he, uh, occupation of duty on mainland uh, China. Uh, I was born uh, in the city or town of Tianjin. And um, uh, for the ones that speak Chinese <laughs> here, my Chinese name is Liu Baohua. Liu is my mother's maiden name. Baohua is precious flower. And my preacher brother calls me the blooming idiot. <laughs> Did you notice I said preacher brother? And, uh, and he's supposed to be generous. He, he served 37 years as a Baptist missionary in Taiwan. His Chinese is marvelous. And uh, my Chinese is Mama Hoo Hoo. And uh, so, so anyway, um, I, I, I don't know what to share with you that you don't already know, except I have to tell you about my liberation. I hope you sometime have the opportunity to go on your website and look up 11th Airborne. And, um, and look up Los Spaniels <coughs> or Santa Tomas. These are the two internment camps. And of course, uh, you military people know about Cabana Tawan and the Bilibi, that, uh, the military. And uh, you may not know, you were earlier somebody mentioning the nurses, Army and Navy nurses, they were in my camp. We had, because they didn't know what to do with the uh, women military at that time. They had facilities to accommodate uh, the, uh, the men uh, POW, but the Army and, nurse, uh, and Navy nurses were in uh, Santa Tomas and Los Banos. I was in Santa Tomas for two years, and uh, to, I don't want to take up too much time, but to get to the Philippines, and my, because my father died when I was so young, my mother was not, I was taken care of by Methodist missionary, then later on by Baptist uh, uh, missionary in China. and. Uh, China was in a war with Japan, and things got worse. And because we inherited, my two brothers and myself inherited my daddy's citizenship, and my mother said, you should leave China and go to America and take advantage of your American citizenship. And the Baptist missionary received permission from my mother. I was 11 years old when I left my mother to go to the Philippines. I did not see her again until I was 40 years old. I met up with her in Hong Kong. And, uh, and, and uh, so she gave permission. Our first lap of the trip was to go to the, uh, um, to the Philippines. And then from there, and, and, had, and, and make our arrangement to come to this country. We landed in Manila November 2nd, 1941. And Pearl Harbor was December. And January the 5th, <clears throat> the Japanese came to the different homes and to interrogate some of the people there. I answered the door. I was 11 years old at that time. I answered the door. And uh, he said to me, he said, you American? First thing I said was well, yes. But if I'd have said no, he might have left me alone because I could pass maybe for Filipino because Philippines, some Filipinos are of mixed blood. And, uh, but I said, no, I'm an American. Oh. So they decided that it was necessary that we go to the Rizal Stadium and some of you that may be familiar with uh, Manila and uh, uh, for interrogation. And the interrogation took place. They said, now we're going to locate you in the University of Santa Tomas and you will be there for a few short days and et cetera, et cetera. That didn't happen. The two short days ended up into two years in the University of Santa Tomas. And the last year, the, the, the story went, and you know if in any big gathering you have rumors. Some are true and some are not. And um, one of the uh, rumor was that uh, the American 
military was getting closer and closer for liberation. We need the structures of the University of Santa Tomas for our own purpose. So they started evacuating some of us out of Manila into the outer skirts community called Los Banos. And uh, this is where the extension of the University of Manila of the Philippines, uh, agriculture area. So Los Banos, and like I said earlier, you all can re, uh, research and further on this, uh, those, both of those camps, Los Banos, and the uh, agriculture area. We lived in Nipa, built with shaved bamboo that was built into uh, barracks to accommodate uh, the internees. And uh, we were there uh, uh, for one year. Um, a food shortage was very, very critical in the latter part uh, of our stay, guests of the Japanese military. And um, uh, my number two brother, the one that called me the blooming idiot, he uh, worked in the kitchen. For working in the kitchen, he can scrape what's in the bottom of the pot and some get extra uh, nourishment. And uh, um, we, we were there for one, for one year in Los Banos. My liberation of the internment by the 11th Airborne. Oh, I love that. 11th Airborne, 11th Airborne, 11th Airborne. And the most spectacular liberation you could ever imagine. Of course, I have no comparison. And, and, uh, but the way that it was coordinated, not to get anybody killed, and, uh, uh, and to get everybody out in time because we were still behind enemy lines. And so the time is of essence. And uh, so, Women and children, amphibious tractors were able to come to the barbed wire fence. And um, the 11th Airborne, they dropped. They went through the barracks. In our barracks, there were cubicles, sleeping rooms. And I was, of course, I didn't have a mother there or a daddy there. And the ladies in the room took care of me. There were six, and, I, and the, so the five ladies. Our barracks were long barracks and cubicles, but the cubicle siding did not completely go to the walkway in the middle of the barracks, the long barracks, sleeping places on both. And um, so the partition to cut us off from the uh, walkway, it was only so. So when the 11th Airborne dropped, and I was the youngest in the room and without parents, and the lady said, Sally, get under the bed. And uh, I did so, and they put mattress around me to protect me. But in the hall area, I was able to see out as, as there. At, by this time, we were under roll call every morning and every evening because there were internees that was try, able to escape during the nighttime and coordinate with the Filipino guerrillas and um, what is going on inside the camp and yet still sneak back in the camp before the roll call that, it, that we were having in, uh, in, in the camp each morning. And so, so the morning, December, uh, November, uh, February 23rd, 1945, I'll give my, I have so many dates in here and, and try to remember anyway. And uh, we were outside for roll call and uh, for the Japanese sentry count and make sure that everybody is in their place and all that. And, uh, and we heard these heavy, heavy, heavy duty engine. 
and we were all standing there and waiting for them to count noses in the and so of course we all looked up there and as you looked up there you saw those little specks all over all over and these things you saw parachute opened up and they landed inside the camp and of course the Japanese sentries that we had there are very much uh, exercise calisthenic minded you know they had their routine every morning and they did not have their firearms and uh, they were had very brief attires on as they were doing calisthenics and uh, uh, so they were unprepared and here comes the 11th airborne floating down and here comes the Filipino freedom fighters I call them Filipino guerrillas uh, talking to youngster four graders I use that word all they could see is this big black tall something so now I use the word the freedom fighters <laughs> instead of the word guerrillas and uh, and anyway, and uh, so 11th Airborne and Filipino guerrillas. And here comes the troopers. And um, Sally was under the bed and protected. And as the 11th Airborne landed and going in there, and the first thing that I saw was paratrooper boots. <laughs> to this day, it makes me go into berserk when I see paratrooper boots. It will all come back again and again. And for whatever reason, and they came through the barriers. And don't take anything, just get out of here because we're behind enemy lines. Get out of here to the front of the camp as fast as you can. And. Uh, we were close to a body of water in the Philippines. They called it a Laguna de Bay, and whatever that translates to, I'm not quite sure. But anyway, and we had to go through this body of water. And see if them tractors came out of the water into the camp and lower the back and uh, women and children first took us over this, through this body of water into uh, one of the civilian prison, uh, <coughs> Bill of it. And uh, for R&R, for R &R. and 21st, 21st evacuation, evacuation hospital was set up there for our first meal. I'll always remember that first meal because our stomach has shrunken so much and that we, they, the 21st evac thought that we should not have solid. The first meal was uh, tomato soup. And so I had a biscuit, get us tomato soup, and eat it in line so we can have more tomato soup when we got to the front of the line. And uh, we were there, and for our aunt who were able, two brothers was there, the Baptist missionary and all, and uh, he was able, uh, we landed in San Pedro. Uh, my coming to this country, it involves all the military branches, paratroopers, army, 21st Evac, army. I came over on a troop transport, Navy ship, staffed by Coast Guard and Marines. It don't get better than that. <laughs> How many of you are that privileged? Really, don't get any better than that. And uh, so it took all the branches of military to get me here. So I am very special in case you haven't noticed. <laughs> so, uh, okay. My background, I said earlier, was missionary that gave us the privy. And of course, following the missionaries, every branch of the military, to all the branches of the military. 
not only them, but also their family that stayed behind. And they kept them, in World War II, we used to say, kept the home fire burning. And uh, so they paid, not only, and all, the families of the military and their families for me to have freedom. Uh, my, uh, John Blaylock, oh, by the way, if you're interested, if you Google John Blaylock, the last name is spelled B-L-A-L-O-C-K, and um, uh, look on the website, he wrote a synopsis book. It's called Through um, Water, Through Fire and Through Water because they burned the barracks when we were liberated by the Levin, because they wanted to burn the barracks to get the civilians out of there as, as, uh, as fast as possible, because we're still behind enemy's line. And uh, so uh, he wrote a book, a booklet, I should say, and it's not as easy reading, based on Psalm 66, verse 12. And that verse reads, Thou hast caused men to ride over our heads. As we were there, I mentioned there were planes over our heads flying, protecting the troop and protecting the internees. We went through fire and through water, Laguna Dubai, and the barracks were on fire and to get us out of there. But thou brought us out of into a wealthy place. Praise the Lord. And uh, we were in 21st Evacuation Hospital, took care of us. So, from the bottom of my heart, all of you, past, present, future, that served, and the families that served along, I thank you for my freedom. And I thank you all, and may God bless you all. Thank you so much, Sally. Next, I'd like to invite Fred Boyles to talk about the early days uh, of the National POW Museum from the National Park Service perspective. Fred served as superintendent of Andersonville National Historic Site from 1989 to 2009. He retired from the National Park Service in 2013 as superintendent of Cumberland Island National Seashore. He also served in the Navy Reserves, retiring at the rank of Captain in 2016. Today, Fred is still serving as the Chairman of the Board of the Friends of Andersonville. Please welcome Fred Boyles. Thank you. I heard Gia the other day say something to the effect of uh, superintendents tell stories and the park staff go, oh no, here we go again. And uh, I can assure you, Gia, that the older you get, the, the longer and more embellished the stories get, and um, the further detached from the truth they are. But um, I, I want to share a little bit about the Friends of Andersonville and uh, um, how the museum came together. But I should always say, I like to say, if you you hear nothing else, we were a family back then, uh, working together. American ex-prisoners of war were the lead. They always were the lead in the project because they represented this incredible veterans organization that had a reach all over the country. And, uh, and, and we, they were the first to come to the park and say, we want to do something together. And, and together it was. The goal was established that two and a half million dollars would be raised to, uh, from private funds to build the museum. And that was, in those days, was a very high goal. Uh, in the end, $700,000 was contributed by individuals. Uh, and there, there actually were 10, over 10,000 people who contributed to the museum. And their names are in the red book that's still there in the, uh, uh, in, in the museum, that uh, two folks, Bill and Nancy Forns, 
put that book together of every name of all the people who contributed to the project. But I want to tell you about one special friend, and that was a, <coughs> a, a dear friend named Carl Runch. And Carl was a POW in World War II, uh, but Carl uh, actually just came and volunteered and said, what can I do to help? And before you knew it, he was the president of the Friends of Andersonville. He, he wouldn't ask that question again. Um, <laughs> Carl was born and raised in Brooklyn, New York. He was an Eagle Scout. And when he joined the military during World War II, he became a navigator in the 8th Air Force and flew on the plane called Ole Miss Agnes. And after the war, and by the way, his captivity was very short, uh, but pretty intense. And because if you know anything about the name Runge, the proper pronunciation was Rungi. Carl was a German-American. In fact, he said he bombed his grandparents' hometown. So it kind of helps you to understand how how difficult these things were. But after the war, he became a salesman. And he sold for MCA, the Music Corporation of America, the parent company of Universal Studios. He sold TV shows to TV stations. And it was in 1970 when he got a phone call out of the blue uh, from the station manager of this little tiny station which had no significance at all. It was the least important station in Atlanta called WTBS. And the guy said, hey, Carl, you need to come over and meet our new owner. It's a guy named Ted Turner and he doesn't know anything about television. And it'd be a good person for you to get to know. And Carl did. And he sold Ted Turner Leave it to Beaver and the Beverly Hillbillies, <laughs> which made Ted Turner a lot of money because all he had before that was professional wrestling. <laughs> and before you knew it, these two guys became friends. And <clears throat> Carl was able to convince his friend, Ted Turner, to make the Andersonville movie. And because Carl said, we're never going to get this museum built if we don't get Andersonville on the map. Because people don't really know what Andersonville is other than the place where a lot of Yankees starved to death. And it's much, much more. So we've got to get more people interested in Andersonville. And sure enough, Turner, Turner had just finished his movie, uh, Gettysburg, and took on the Andersonville project, which cost $14 million to produce. And uh, that year that the film came out and it aired on Turner Network Television, uh, our visitation here went to 200,000 that year. Broke all records. And it did. It helped put Andersonville on the map. Carl, another thing that Carl did was he met with a fella up in Montezuma, let's see if I'm that way, named Dean Fowler. And Dean Fowler said, if you need help, go to the Department of Transportation. They've got all the money. And so Dean Fowler, George Hooks, Carl Runge, and myself, we met with the commissioner of the Department of Transportation and said, we need your help on this project. And right then and there, the commissioner committed to 1.2 uh, 1.2 uh, million dollars to build the entrance road and parking lot that is here. And it was the very first ice tea project in Georgia. Ice tea, inner, inner surf, uh, I S T E A, Intermodal Surface Transportation Enhancement Act. Anyway, the commissioner of DOT said, That's the only ice tea project I've ever liked. And uh, Ice-T still goes on today. In fact, Lewis and I were mentioning that earlier this morning. And sure enough, uh, uh, that's, that was a huge factor in getting the project off the ground. Senator Hooks, by the way, got the matching money. It had to be non-federal. And he got matching money through the state. And uh, we, 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 that was incredibly important. Carl also figured out that corporations, we all think, oh, corporations give a lot of money for projects like this. 
No, they don't. They really don't. Um, and we learned that the hard way. We got a lot of, there were all kinds of doors slammed in Carl's face, but he, he kept going and always kept trying to, to uh, seek more funds. And then he met a fellow named Pete McTeer, who was the director of the Woodruff Foundation. And he was able to convince him, and also, by the way, we had the help of a person named Griffin Bell, former Attorney General from Americas and former federal judge. Judge Bell knew all the right people in the Woodruff Foundation and helped grease the skids. So the largest single donation to the construction of the museum was $250,000 that came from uh, the Woodruff Foundation. There were actually 11 foundations that contributed and 25 different corporations that contributed uh, to, to the project. But by far, and I'm sure many of you, if not all, know that the real thing that got the museum over the top was the coin. And the coin came to be because of the 1993 uh, Veterans Coin Act. And it was fascinating because Congressman Bishop, I wish he was still here, he mentioned about the coin and he, he was brand new in Congress. He had just been elected. He had no seniority. And he shared with Carl one day, he said, you know, he said, we can't get this bill out of committee. And, and well, what committee is it? Well, there's a committee, it's a banking committee that has oversight over the mint, the U.S. mint. And the chairman says there's just so many of these project, coin projects. Everybody wanted one. Uh, you know, think of every good project all over the country. And so, well, who's the chairman? Well, it's Joseph Kennedy from Massachusetts. And Carl said, there's a Massachusetts monument right over there. So we fixed up, at Carl's suggestion, a beautiful framed print of the Massachusetts monument that Congressman Bishop presented uh, to his colleague, the chairman of the, of the coin committee from uh, Massachusetts. And sure enough, it got out of committee. But it also took a lot of people like uh, uh, Bill Rowland and uh, Wayne Hitchcock and uh, Chuck Williams, who went all over the halls of Congress because there were over 200 sponsors of that bill to, to get the coin made that took it over the top. And by the way, the coin had it with it, the coin bill had with it that there was to be a $1 million endowment fund to support the park and the museum, but the coin sales never got all the way to that threshold. And that's when Carl said, let's raise money and create our own endowment fund. And I thought, oh my goodness, we just, we're just getting the museum built. How can we raise more money? Well, that fund, as you, I'm sure many of you know, is now at over two and a half million dollars uh, in the corpus and has contributed over one million dollars to the National Park Service and projects here at Andersonville National Historic Site. Now, oh, by the way, the first fifty thousand dollars which came in for the fund came thanks to the museum or to the movie uh, premieres that were held and raised funds um, for, for that project as well. It sounds like that Carl did it all by himself. No. He was constantly bringing in all sorts of people to help. He made sure that we got endorsements and articles in the New York Times, the Washington Post, USA Today, Parade Magazine, CNN, and C-SPAN. He convinced the Atlanta Journal-Constitution editorial board to write editorials to support funding, the federal side of the funding for the project. And there were like three or four different editorials in the AJC supporting the project. He also was able to convince Presidents Bush, Reagan, Carter, Ford, and Nixon to endorse the project. Those were small things, but they went a long way to saying this is a project for the whole country to get behind. He was able to convince Governor Zell Miller that this was a great project to get behind as well. And, and he, uh, Carl hosted Governor Miller and, are you ready for this, when Zell Miller was a young second lieutenant in the Marine Corps in Vietnam, his sergeant that kept him alive 
was a fellow named George Burledge, who was a Bataan Death March survivor. And so Zell Miller and Lance, you shouldn't know about this, but I'm going to tell you anyway. Zell Miller and George Burledge landed their helicopter right over here in the prison site in the middle of the government shutdown in 1996 and went on a tour of the park. And, and Zell Miller got behind the project as well. Other people like Carl convinced Newt Gingrich to support, at the time he was Speaker of the House, to support the project. That helped with the funding in a big way. Uh, but Lang Sheffield, Randy Jones, Bud McKenzie, I could go on and on, who worked with all these folks to help bring the state, the folks in Georgia, but the folks in our local area, uh, working with the American ex-prisoners of war uh, to get the project done. Today, the Friends of Andersonville continues that work. And our buddy Carl is over in Section J, grave number 587. And we miss him. I'll tell you this, Carl would tell you if he were here today, because he would do this all the time. He'd just look you right in the face and he'd say, <laughs> I love you. And that was his spirit. Like so many others, like Sally, and Bill, and Bill, and Wayne, who've sacrificed so much for our country. We love you. We love this place, and we love what it stands for in educating this and future generations about the meaning of this country. Thank you. Thank you so much, Fred. Um, I'd like to invite Lance Hatton, National Park Service, Region 2, Deputy D Regional Director, to say a few words. With more than 30 years of federal service, Lance Hatton is a proud military veteran and dedicated employee who's worked in a broad range of positions throughout the National Park Service. Please welcome Lance Hatton. Thank you. I stand here in gratitude of my predecessors, uh, Superintendent Boyles, Superintendent Wagner. I stand here in gratitude for Congressman Bishop, a, a longtime supporter of this park and the National Park Service. I stand here in gratitude of Bill and, and Sally for, for what they've done in honoring uh, their own spirit in our country. I'm honored to be here to represent our regional director, Mark Faust, and, and the National Park Service here this afternoon. The National Park Service preserves our country's great treasures. At historic sites across the country, we honor men and women leaders and visionaries, everyday people like our veterans, like, like Bill, like Sally, who in full measures of devotion suffered for our nation. Here at Andersonville National Historic Site, the humanity of many was tested. People struggled and suffered and many die. We keep their memories alive by sharing what they experienced as American prisoners of war. We enjoy others to remember their resilience here at the final resting place of over 20,000 veterans and spouses. The stories we tell come from diaries, historical documents, and most importantly, from firsthand accounts of our former prisoners of war, many you just experienced and heard. The building of this museum was spearheaded by American ex-prisoners of war, the Friends of Andersonville, 
and others like former Superintendent Fred Boyles who sacrificed to make this museum a reality. We are here to honor their achievement on its 25th anniversary, as well as the National Park Service achievements and its many employees who have researched, preserved, and told stories. They continue to innovate and adapt to new ways of learning about the experiences of our veterans and our prisoners of war and storytelling. We are so grateful for those who have recorded oral histories, written books, and spoken here at Andersonville so that the public does not forget the sacrifices of our soldiers and our civilians who suffered for our freedoms. Visitors to the museum leave here deeply affected by the history of Andersonville and the stories of our prisoners of war. We look forward to continuing this work into the future with the continued support of the American ex-prisoners of war, the Friends of Andersonville. And over the next 25 years, we plan to work with our partners to keep our exhibits updated and to make them more accessible and to keep up with technological advances so that we can continue to receive priceless artifacts, memoirs, and important oral histories and share them with visitors here and around the world. In closing, I want to thank all of our veterans for their service to our country. I want to thank our many partners, those individuals and groups who raised awareness and funds to get the National Prisoner of War Museum built and operational, and who continue to support the entirety of Andersonville National Historical Site. We are eternally grateful. Thank you. Thank you, Lance. Um, I'd like to thank all of our speakers for joining us today to talk about their experiences uh, here. I hope you've enjoyed our event to commemorate all former POWs, the 50th anniversary of Operation Homecoming, and the celebration of the 25th anniversary of a museum died designed to honor prisoners of war throughout American history. In the National Park Service, um, a lot of us are fond of saying we're in the forever business. Our mission at Andersonville is to tell the stories of all American prisoners of war. The tireless efforts of many here today ensure that everyone has a place to learn, appreciate, and reflect on the sacrifices, strengths, and resilience of our American prisoners of war. This completes our program today. I encourage you to mingle, ask questions, enjoy the museum. Um, and again, thank you for being here. It really is an honor to have you. Thanks.